great to see and meet all of you. And yeah, thanks, Anna, for the warm welcome. Um, I'm really excited about sharing some of my learnings with you and also um, yeah, discussing um, all the questions that you might have um, at the end of this talk. So yeah, without further ado, I'll get started. Um, so um, I believe that building successful digital products really requires two things, as we also just heard from Hannah. It's discovering the right product and building the product right. And um, with product discovery, I mean all the work around understanding problems, experimenting with many different solutions, and then figuring out which solution solves the problem best. And um, with building the product right with product delivery, um, I mean kind of defining the solution in all its detail, implementing it, and then shipping it. And um, based on my experience, I think winning product development teams really need to master, but also balance these two types of work, product discovery and product delivery. Um, yet what I've experienced, and it's a little different from what I just saw in, um, in your voting, uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, if that really represented your day or if that was wishful uh, thinking, but what I hear um, from friends in the industry and what I also um, experienced myself is that um, while there is a lot of fuss around product discovery and while people would love to spend a lot of time on it um, in the day to day life of product development teams, delivery work still gets much more attention than discovery work. And, um, and throughout this talk, when I talk about product development teams, I'm always referring to this um, set of people, product designer or UX, UI designer, however you want to call it, a product manager, a couple of engineers, maybe user researcher. Um, so yeah, all these people working together on a product or a part of the product. And I think especially from, from many product designers, I often hear that they're spending way too much time on just quickly fixing something here or just copying um, a, a solution from a successful competitor instead of really taking the time to dive into problems and discovering the best solution. And um, I personally think that this is a big problem because if discovery work isn't really balanced with delivery work, then I think that teams might be popping out lots and lots of features and light speed and everything is optimized, how these cross-functional teams are running sprints, how you do quality assurance, um, how you have the visually perfectly designed features. But in the end, these features are often really not what the customer needs and therefore they don't really lead to the expected outcome. So I am definitely strongly advocating for a much more balanced time distribution, but also attention between discovery and delivery work. Um, I think this in the end might lead to a little less features, but hopefully the right ones that actually solve a customer problem. And um, yeah, when, when I realized that um, these two types of works are often not really balanced, I was wondering where this paradox is coming from because I think everyone knows and a lot of people agree that um, discovery matters and that especially product designers should really spend the majority of time on it, but it still often lags behind delivery work in terms of the time spent, but also how professionally it's being done and how professional all the, the structures around are set up. And um, I guess there are multiple reasons for this phenomenon to happen. Um, but I assume that one of the, the key reasons is that discovery work requires collaboration, while delivery work can be done in a much more cooperative manner. Um, and for this rather cooperative delivery work, where you just divide and conquer, there are all these frameworks like Scrum or Kanban that you can study and follow. But there aren't really a lot of frameworks of how to do discovery in a collaborative way. And I think these frameworks might make it a lot easier to set up functioning professional structures. And therefore they probably lead to this imbalance because I think people tend to just kind of focus on the things that, that are easy and run smoothly. And I think while the nature of this, this exploratory discovery work um, makes it probably impossible to set up a similar, very fixed uh, framework, 
Um, but I still think that there are certain activities and yeah, certain principles that one can follow in order to improve the collaboration in terms of discovery and to make sure that maybe through better collaboration, um, you get to a bit more uh, balance between discovery and delivery. And um, this is what I also want to focus on in this talk. I would love to share some of my tips for effective collaboration and product. Uh, discovery. Um, but before we dive into solutions, I would love to do what all good designers do and um, take a look at the problem first. So why do we even need tips for collaboration? Why is it actually so difficult to do discovery collaboratively? Um, I personally think it's due to three different reasons. First of all, um, I think that usually it's not really a linear process that leads to the final solution. I think on paper, um, we all, most teams try to follow this double diamond uh, process when it comes to discovery. You discover a problem that fits a business outcome, you narrow down the problem, then you go broad about brainstorming and testing multiple solutions, and finally you settle on a solution. And I think while this looks like a fairly streamlined linear process, in reality, you often jump back and forth between these stages. Um, I don't know, while you're um, validating multiple solutions, you realize that you had completely misinterpreted the problem. Or while standing under the shower in the morning, you suddenly have this ingenious idea for a completely different solution than the one that you and your team maybe already spent quite some days on. And um, I think it is this continuous process of counter correcting. Maybe it doesn't look as bad as I show here on the right side, but it's certainly, or at least in my experience, never as streamlined as this double diamond uh, might suggest. And I think this can be frustrating and it makes the whole process a little hard to predict. And for an individual to navigate another turn on this right, I think can be really hard, but doing that with a whole team of people can be even harder um, because it's very easy to quickly turn a small sailboat, but it's much harder to turn a big tanker. And this is, I guess, one of the reasons why um, collaborative um, discovery in a team is difficult. The second difficulty um, of collaborative discovery work that I see is that discovery is usually a multi-lane road. I think um, the outcome of discovery initiatives is by nature unclear. There's always the possibility that you simply end an initiative because you figure out that the problem that you were uh, looking at is maybe not as severe as you thought it would be. And um, in fact, I think teams that never end an exploration uh, of an opportunity probably are not doing the brave and open-minded discovery work that they think they do. And because things might end early, I think it's usually wise to have several irons in the fire, um, which means you push multiple initiatives forward at the same time. And I think similar to the former point, running things in parallel is already a mental challenge um, for an individual. But then coordinating parallel work as a team is even more challenging and makes this collaboration quite difficult. And last but not least, um, I think discovery work is an art as much as a science. And therefore, um, yeah, I think high performing product teams try to usually work as scientifically as possible. Before you move anything into delivery, you're usually validating hypothesis, problem hypothesis, solution hypothesis um, based on data. Um, but in my opinion, it's usually impossible to get to this 100% guarantee that something is indeed the right problem to look at um, or indeed the best solution you could find. Um, you usually only figure that out after you shipped um, the piece of software. I think experiments with prototypes are super important, um, but eventually they are only proxies for the real solution. And therefore, intuition does play a role when you take product decisions in discovery. Um, I think decisions simply cannot be taken purely scientifically um, as much as we would hope for this. 
Um, and because intuition of different team members can differ, um, this is usually the part where collaboration becomes tricky and leads to lengthy discussion because the product manager thinks um, we should go for this direction and maybe you as a product or UX designer um, believe that the other solution works much better. So in conclusion, I think collaborative product discovery is really difficult. It's not a linear process. You do multiple things at the same time. Um, and you sometimes have to take decisions based on gut feeling and issue, intuition. So this is really hard to do together as a team. Yet, I think wonderful things can happen if you figure out how to do collaborative um, product discovery effectively. If it's not just the designer doing it all by themselves, but kind of involving um, other team members as well. And um, with my teams at Navis um, and then Bubble and now of course Saiga, um, I've tried out many different ways for um, effective collaboration. And yeah, some things worked really well, others not at all. Um, and inspired by all these learnings, um, some of the failures, some of the successes, um, I've put together six tips for effective collaboration um, that I would love to share with you. And I hope they will help you and the teams you're working in to do better discovery work together. So um, my first tip is to establish a small core team within your cross-functional product team that drives all discovery decisions. Um, in my opinion, product discovery generally um, requires active participation from everyone in the team. Good ideas can come from everywhere um, and no one should be excluded from that. So it is really a collective responsibility, not a task for selected team members. Um, yeah, just from my own experience, sometimes the back end engineer um, has the best idea for kind of a very innovative solution um, that no one else uh, was aware of. But at the same time, everyone is involved in each and every decision, things become super duper slow and inefficient. So I think the best compromise that I've seen working well between yeah, being fast and still kind of yeah, having different perspective when it comes to decisions and product discovery is to have um, a core team that represents the key functions required to take important discovery decisions. Um, and they really run discovery um, and drive everything forward. Um, and this is usually um, a product designer, UX designer, however you want to call it, a lead engineer and a product manager. Um, this can, of course, also involve a UX researcher, a content person. I think this really depends um, on the product you're building and the general team topology. But I think the key is that this is a fairly small group that has an overview of all discovery initiatives that are happening and that brings in these different perspectives or the different expertise to decisions. And I think by keeping this team really small, it's much easier to take these decisions and take these turns in this non-linear process of discovery work. And that does, of course, not mean that the rest of the team is not allowed to take part in discovery at all. I think they, they simply contribute in a much more light touch. Um, at Zyga, uh, where I'm currently working, we run, for example, design updates where all engineers are invited to give feedback um, to concepts that we're working on. Um, and we're doing that um, every second week. Um, we're also inviting engineers um, to interviews from time to time. Um, and we have bi-weekly, um, we call them inspire and breakfast meetings where everyone and not just um, these, this core team is encouraged to share products um, that we can draw inspiration from. So I think there are ways to kind of establish this core team and still involve other people into discovery work. And um, yeah, if you want to read up a little more about this concept, um, I can highly recommend you to take a look at Teresa Torres' content. Um, she has written a lot about this. Um, she always um, calls this uh, the, the product trio. So my tip number two is that um, I believe that it's super important to clarify roles that everyone plays in this core team or in this product trio team. Um, I think to develop a successful product, everything you build needs to be valuable, viable, usable, and feasible 
and probably also ethical. Um, this is something that is missing here uh, on my slide. And the good thing about a cross-functional team is that different functions bring in the expertise to evaluate these different aspects. But if it's not really clear who's responsible to contribute in which way, then I think certain aspects can either be overlooked or people feel that they're not really taken seriously. And one thing that I've seen um, as a problem um, is that when it comes to evaluating um, the value of a solution, I think many companies still see that as something that product managers are supposed to evaluate and that product designers should purely focus on usability. And personally, I don't think um, it should work like that. I think both product managers and product designers should really have the skill set to evaluate the value of a solution um, for a customer. And I think if you, for example, feel that this is a topic in your team, I would always bring it up and discuss it because in order to do a good job in a team, I think everyone needs to be aware of what they are expected um, to deliver and also what other team members are expected to deliver. And um, yeah, while I think role clarity is important, I also think that um, roles and responsibilities should really not be set in stone. And I think everyone in this product trio should still be encouraged to think holistically. I think an engineer should still be encouraged to challenge the viability of a solution, even if it was proposed by the product manager who's considered a business expert. Um, and I think a product manager should still be fine with building a prototype when the designer is on vacation and an initiative still needs to be moved forward. Um, I think this is very similar to team sport. So I'm, for example, I'm playing basketball and I'm a center player. So I'm expected to am really good at catching rebounds. But I'm super happy if our point card also from time to time catches a rebound um, if she's standing at the right um, location. So I think it's important to not get stuck in your roles um, and kind of keep in mind that eventually you're all working towards the same goal. Um, tip number three is that product discovery should really be about your users, your customers, and not about the team that is building the product and whose opinion is winning. And I think people with big egos um, are usually harming customer-centric collaborative work. Um, and because discovery is an art as much as a science, not everything can be proven by data. And in such situations, I think the, the product trio has to take best guess decisions based on intuition or gut feeling. And I think big ego people um, will have a hard time accepting um, other people's opinion if they're contradicting their own. Um, they won't be able to disagree and commit, which I think is sometimes necessary in order to move an idea forward quickly. So I guess in case you are um, involved into hiring or if you're looking to join a new team, I would always, always check if the people you will work with are interested in the thing itself or rather in themselves in their own opinion and if it's the latter then uh, don't hire them uh, don't join this team because i think this will really make collaborative discovery work almost impossible um, then the fourth collaboration recommendation that i have is to establish a common language in your team i think different disciplines have different lingo if a product manager talks about performance, they usually mean something else than when an engineer um, is using this term. Or when you as a designer talk about the complexity of a concept, um, you're probably referring to something else than your engineering colleague might have in mind. But for effective collaboration between these functions, between these disciplines, you really need to understand each other. And um, yeah, based on my experience, there's uh, three things that you can do. Um, there's probably much more, but three things that um, I've experienced working well in order to establish this common language. So the first one is that you can really try to establish a culture where it's completely normal to ask for uh, someone to explain a term. 
um, you can encourage this by um, setting up a glossary where you add all these terms that not everyone might know. Um, working at a machine learning, at an AI product at Zyga, we have quite a lot of technical machine learning terms. And therefore we have set up such a glossary um, to define those terms. And we also run sessions where our head of engineering explains product designers and product managers our database setup and the whole kind of terminology around that. And um, this is super helpful. I think this really helps to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Um, the other thing you can do to establish a common language is to just stop talking and start drawing instead. Um, I think there is this saying that a picture is worth a, a thousand words. And I think that's quite correct. Uh, shared understanding is often much more easily derived from drawing a sketch than from just talking through an idea. And um, while, yeah, particularly uh, you as designers are probably aware of that, I think in the day-to-day -day work that is easily forgotten. And I realize that uh, whenever we have a lengthy discussion, um, team we usually get to the point where we say okay um, how about we just stop the discussion here and visualize what we mean and I think this is also where the design superpower really comes in and where you as designers um, who are really good at quickly visualizing something can take up this role and also help your team visualize um, whatever they're um, trying to to say or express and um, yeah, last but not least, if you want to establish a common language, I think you also need to define a specific discovery terminology that you are using. I think not everyone might be familiar with the concept of how might we questions or use a story mapping um, terminology. And um, again, I think this is something where US designers can play a big role in outlining different methods, explaining them to product management, to your engineering colleague. Um, and like that, you're also making sure that you um, yeah, together can decide which of these methods sometimes uh, fits your process best. And um, for example, in my former job at Navis, we used to run introductory sessions where each time someone else explained um, a discovery concept or methodology or tool um, to the rest of the trio or sometimes even the whole product development team. And like that, we step-by-step -step built up a toolbox of discovery tools that everyone knew and understood. And um, yeah, to do this, I can highly recommend these uh, three sources here that outline different methods and explain terminology, um, I think, quite nicely. Um, yeah, then my collaboration tip number five is that you and your team clearly define when you need to get together as a team and when different team members can do part of the discovery work individually. I think working collaboratively does not certainly does certainly not mean that you do everything together. Um, you don't have to read an API documentation together um, to validate feasibility. This is something that tech lead can do. And you also don't all have to sit in front of a screen to build a detailed click through prototype together. Um, I think to be efficient, product trios really need to divide and conquer at times, but then get together um, at these moments in time when multiple brains really make a difference. And I think this is usually at three occasions. First, when you have to take decisions, because I think effective collaboration really requires that everyone buys into important decisions. Um, I think the easiest way to achieve this is by taking decisions together. And like that, everyone will feel hurt. Um, and you also make sure that all the important perspectives are considered. Um, so here in this picture, you see our product trio, or in our case, with four people um, yeah, discussing an important decision in one of the, the bigger concepts we're currently working on. Um, another occasion where I think it's helpful to get together is when you ideate solutions. I think the, the beauty of brainstorming is that one can build up on the ideas of others. And I guess the most creative ideas usually derive from group brainstorming and not by a single person sitting in front of their desk and having this ingenious idea. And um, third, I think it's always helpful to um, get together when you talk to users. Um, 
I think like that, you really create a shared understanding because hearing someone talk is quite different from reading a quote afterwards. Um, so it's very helpful if you make sure that, yeah, it's not only you as a designer or you as a user researcher interviewing someone, but that you're bringing in product manager and a tech lead um, to these occasions as well. And um, yeah, at Zyga, to make sure that we really get together um, often enough to take decisions, to brainstorm, to talk to users. Um, we've set up a couple of um, yeah, concrete meetings to do that. Um, we have product trio dailies um, where we update each other about progress. Um, we have weekly discovery meetings to prioritize and to dive into concepts together to decide something, to brainstorm something. Um, and since last week, we also have fixed user interview slots. And I think this is really helpful because in delivery, you usually, especially when you work in Scrum, you have all these fixed meetings, the Scrum planning, the retro, the daily, and in discovery, this easily ends up in, oh, we just meet and talk whenever time fits. And I think this is one of the reasons why discovery sometimes is forgotten because there aren't, you don't have this similar rhythm that you have in delivery. And, um, then my very last tip is to have a single source of truth where all discovery work is documented. Um, because discovery is this multi-lane road where different um, activities run in parallel and where one is often jumping back and forth, um, I think it's critical that you document decisions and that you have this overview um, in which phase of the discovery process a certain initiative is. I think that helps everyone to keep an overview and to also make sure that everyone is working on the latest insights. Um, and I guess at Zyga, we haven't really found the, the golden tool yet to do that, but what is working okay-ish is to have a very simple notion section where um, we have a board where we describe the different uh, discovery stages and just kind of drag a ticket for each of the uh, discovery initiatives along the board. And um, yeah, in each uh, of these tickets, um, we describe uh, the initiative in detail. We try uh, describe what's the problem we're trying to solve, who's the target persona, what are the underlying assumptions. And from there, we're also linking to any other sources, to Figma, for example, or then later on before we move things into discovery to the respective um, JIRA ticket. And yeah. Um, this is it. These were my six tips and I hope that um, they were helpful and hands-on enough so that you can take something away from it and that they will hopefully help you bring a little more balance into discovery or delivery or as we heard at the beginning, many of you are already spending enough time on discovery, but maybe it helps you to pull your colleagues from other discipline, your product management, your uh, engineering colleagues into discovery uh, a little more often so that they also get to a bit more balance here. And that in the end together, um, you can develop products that make your customers a little happier. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions and um, I also linked here my Medium article um, in case you yeah, want to read up um, on some of these ideas. Uh, wonderful, thank you so much uh, for <laughs> that really great talk. Um, I got really excited in the beginning. I hadn't seen like the, the when you were talking about um, the collaborating versus, uh, okay, now I'm forgetting the other C word, uh, mm -hmm. constructing or mm -hmm. cooperating. Yeah. And seeing yeah. the difference with the visuals like that was really like, it just really, um, solidified your idea of putting a visual up for a concept. <laughs> um, but it was really nice to think about how you can still work with people, but it can't, it's not always collaborating. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have a, a ton of questions, so I'd love to jump into them. Um, I like to remind people, uh, please upvote some. We just had a, a bunch of ones that came in. So if you wanna take a look at them again and see if there's something new that popped up that you really like uh, answered, please go in there and vote for them as well. Um, but I'll start with one. 
um, which was one of our first ones, and I think our most popular one is uh, how well, it says how do you push discovery in a product team that has never like been used to it before, or how do you kind of advocate for some of these um, ideas that you're talking about when it's not already in the company as uh, something that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think yeah, this is something I also uh, dealt with uh, myself before. I think the important thing is to, to educate, um, to um, explain what is discovery, um, why is it important. Um, yeah, because otherwise you're trying to, to push something forward and people are not familiar with it and they might, uh, might be afraid of uh, kind of getting involved into something. Um, and then I think um, it is, uh, yeah, helpful to, yeah, to invite people to get into it, but maybe then at the beginning, first start doing a little bit yourself, a little more than maybe at a later stage and bring people in um, at occasion, say like, okay, let's do an ideation together and then I'll run the rest of the process, not overdo it. I think what I've seen happening quite a lot is then at some point you're inviting all engineers to all user interviews and ideation sessions and then suddenly the engineers feel they don't have the time to um, write code anymore and then they get annoyed and then they think, oh, this discovery is nothing that I ever want to get uh, involved into any longer so kind of find the balance um, and um, yeah um, figure try, try to to um, spoot, uh, spoon feed it um, <laughs> to the team but start with education send some articles around this is something that I'm usually doing from I don't know Marty Kagan Teresa Torres these people that write a lot about discovery and they bring the background also from super successful companies so also underline a little bit with um, yeah with with facts and data that discovery is worthwhile doing yeah I love that suggestion of I'm hearing also like show don't tell <laughs> like yeah <laughs> like start small is like can you show the power of it by implementing something on your own first and then educating to kind of get people on board as well um really nice uh one of another kind of common topic in in the questions i'm noticing is uh, about tight deadlines and um one specifically is asking uh, if a team is on a tight deadline two weeks from discovery to designing the final solution so really kind of quick um how do you decide how much time to spend in discovery or how do you um are there any like factors that you think about of judging how much time is worth or needed for those times mm -hmm. mm, yeah i think it's usually hard or I, I think better than saying like, okay, in two weeks, we need to have this, uh, this live. Um, I mean, sometimes you have these really hard deadlines, but I think in, in most cases, the deadlines are not as hard as maybe some external stakeholder might suggest. And then I think it's usually better to say, okay, let's time box the discovery uh, part and say like, okay, if we roughly know, I don't know, we will need for a medium sized solution to implement it, we will need one sprint, two weeks, and how much time do we really have um, for the discovery part of it and address it right at the beginning and make it clear to kind of the rest of the team, if we kind of time box that to a week, then we will get to something that is probably where we will still have a lot of risk involved. Um, because if, if it's just one week, then we probably cannot explore three different solutions, but only one and always kind of argue with this, hey, we, we can do that, but then the risk is higher that we're building the wrong thing. And then two weeks of um, engineering development time are wasted on something that we then maybe afterwards need to work up on again. So I think challenging these deadlines um, by kind of explaining why, uh, why sometimes discovery is worthwhile uh, spending a little more time on is good. But on the other hand side, I also think that often people are like, oh, no, we need four weeks um, to do proper discovery. And I think sometimes, yeah, in, in my study program in Denmark, we often had kind of this one week to develop something. And we thought, okay, this is impossible. We can't really do that. And in the end, I think kind of shortage of time also um, is 
often a good driver for creativity um, and for being a, a little faster and thinking about, okay, maybe I don't have to run 12 user research interviews, maybe four are enough and I realize, okay, always hearing the same thing so I can stop here and move things a little faster. Yeah, I think um, that also makes me think um, from the previous two, like the two questions, um, I'm kind of curious, this is my own personal question of like, how do workshops fit into like the structure and, and bringing in with collaborating? So I'm, cause I'm thinking about showing and not telling and maybe doing things on short timelines. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that fits, like how often you're using them and how that fits into the structure as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're using workshops um, quite a bit, but I also realized I often don't call them workshops because then people, a lot of people get afraid of the term workshop and they feel like oh, this like sounds like a, a, a super big thing and I need to prepare everything. So we try to call, just call these um, ideation workshops meetings <laughs> um, so that um, whoever is joining, um, yeah, it doesn't feel like they need to prepare and follow up um, on a lot of things. And then, um, yeah, I think, it is also about yeah thinking about how you can shorten it last week we ran a design sprint in one and a half days would i have loved to do it in four or five days yes would i have gotten our head of operations into it and our ceo if that was a four or five day design sprint never ever so i think this is again this kind of spoon feeding and then after this workshop everyone was like oh i've never done that that was great that was really cool and i think like that starting with very short um yeah workshops and then if people see okay that is working well then maybe next time you can do it a little longer if that is helpful, if you um, if you feel that one and a half hours are enough, then maybe it's enough, um, and you don't necessarily always need to follow the book. I think this is this yeah the the design sprint was developed for um, five days, but I think often I don't know you've you've understood the problem already good enough before you go into this um, design sprint, so you can uh, skip the the first day of it, for example. Yeah, fitting the kind of goal of what you want out of that moment to the activities that you're actually doing and stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, great. We have um, a couple questions here as well about data and thinking about um, one of them is particularly again, again about like uh, convincing highly analytical decision makers to move from discovery to delivery and like using data as a source. Like, are there any strategies or thoughts you have around kind of how data might fit into some of these um, decision making or getting people on board to this phases as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the question is how how do we get people who rather come from a very analytical background into discovery by convincing them with data? Yeah, it asks, do you have any strategies around like convincing highly analytical people mm -hmm. about like um, using data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I feel. I'm oh, sorry. It's sorry. Mm -hmm. I missed, I missed a very important word there, which is when data is scarce. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I was just like, isn't the, the answer already yeah. in, the, um, in the question? Yeah. Because yeah, I, I think usually when, especially when you work in a team where kind of engineering and the tech perspective is very prevalent, and it's usually good to argue with a lot of kind of facts um, and, um, and data. But I think if it isn't if you don't if you simply in our case like we we don't have a lot of customers at the moment so the data we track is doesn't really tell a lot so we are relying on qualitative data and i think in these cases it helps a lot to bring these very analytical people to an interview and to also do the synthesis with these people so they understand that qualitative research um i mean this is also data in the end but um, that qualitative um, research uh, is also done in a structured way and is worth as much as quantitative data. Um, yeah, that that would be my <laughs> my recommendation. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Whenever I mean, even still to this day, when I hear like data, I 
my initial instinct is always going to like quantitative data yeah. and numbers and stuff. But even though I live in a qualitative world where like I do much more with qualitative data than quantitative, it still feels like you there's this pressure sometimes to like translate qualitative to a quantifiable um, way as well. And um, that's a whole nother maybe talk another time. But <laughs> I'm really glad that you kind of touched on like qualitative data is just as important as well. And so there's ways to talk to people or gain other insights um, in discovery. That's not just from uh, yeah. Yeah, and analytics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And really underlying that I think analytics is really great to understand where to put focus on, but it will usually not tell you why the, the why behind it, right? Like, why are people dropping off there? This is then again, like a lot of assumptions and therefore you all usually need to follow up with qualitative research on, um, on the quantitative data you get. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a couple like quick questions in here about because I know you mentioned um, one is maybe making the workshops meetings, but also I really like the comparison you had to the delivery phase where there's like um, scrum and convent where there's all these meetings that are kind of structured in that and setting some structure to discovery as well that has um, some of these uh, cadence meetings. Um, how do you not then get overwhelmed by just meetings all the time, especially if you're kind of in between those two phases as well, or um, if you're working in Scrum or Agile, in addition to that, um, do you have any ideas or suggestions around not having meetings all the time, but. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Well, we just did because I think, yeah, we, we had just that we, yeah, we, I mean, delivery and discovery is running in parallel and kind of the meetings were scattered all over the day. What we just did in the companies to say we have meeting free afternoons. So all meetings are in the morning. This is leads to maybe being in the meeting for two and a half hours. Um, but in the end, um, yeah, you, you have a lot of free time in the afternoon and not just kind of scattered half hours um, all over. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that is just a, a general thing um, about meetings that one can consider. Um, and then I think keeping these discovery meetings, the, the kind of the standard ones relatively short um, and making like in, in our um, product trio daily, we, yeah, we do it for 15 minutes, we keep it short. And then in this meeting, we often realize, oh, we need to discuss that. Oh, we, we need to kind of take a closer look at this uh, prototype our designer was um, working on. And then we schedule these ad hoc meetings there. So I think it's not about having five hours blocked discovery meeting time in the calendar, but rather these kind of short moments to always make sure that you talk about discovery and then have a moment in time where you make sure that, oh, you realize that uh, because just seeing the, the face of the, uh, like in our case, the head of engineering is like, oh yeah, I, I should also ask Michael um, and show him this prototype. I completely forgot and I have this kind of technical question about it. So I think it's more about, yeah, bringing in some frequency than um, spending a lot of time on fixed meeting slots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for all of your uh, the questions from the audience. Thanks, the audience, for the questions. Thank you for your presentation and answering um, some really tough questions, but also really, I feel inspired. I feel already like, can come away with some things. Um, it was great to hear some practical um, cases that you were using this in previous jobs. Um, and as a going out, is there, if people wanted to get in contact with you or ask you some further questions, there's a way that people can reach you. Yes, definitely. I'm happy to um, yeah to further discuss this topic via LinkedIn. I think that's the, the easiest way to reach out. Okay.